Okay, so it would be really nice if you could bank organs, but can you? I mean, uh, if it can't be done, then there's nothing to talk about. Um, I showed in 1984 that you can bank rabbit kidneys in the vitreous state. Uh, the question is, can you do it in a way that they survive when you warm them back up again? The first demonstration that this kind of crazy idea might be possible uh, appeared in 1985 in a paper that Bill Rawl and I published showing that embryos could be vitrified and recovered regardless of the cooling rate that they were cooled and warmed at, um, or that they were cooled at. Um, and that revolutionized the field of uh, reproductive cryobiology and it, it's, it's been used uh, in animal husbandry and human uh, medicine quite a lot. Uh, since that demonstration, the field has grown at a double exponential rate. There are many, many things that can be preserved by vitrification. Uh, these are all different kinds of cells. These are tissues, organs, and, um, and, and even organisms. All of the red entries are uh, things that we've done at 21st Century Medicine and the rest of the world has contributed these other uh, areas. I'm just going to focus kind of on the ultimate goal here, which is an intact organ uh, for the time being. Uh, this year we published um, in Organogenesis uh, the survival of a vitrified transplanted kidney. Um, this is the protocol that we went through. I won't belabor that. This is a temperature trace showing all parts of the kidney were below this critical temperature at which the preservation time goes off to infinity, the glass transition temperature. And these graphs just show recovery and stabilization of kidney function after transplantation. This shows the survival of the part of the kidney that's the hardest to preserve. So it's not a fantasy to be able to preserve whole organs at cryogenic temperatures. We're now working on preserving the heart at cryogenic temperatures because after all, that's what most of those people with organ failure die of. Uh, it's looking good so far. Uh, we're we're uh, well along the way. This heart is at minus 30 and uh, completely non-frozen and uh, viable. Okay, uh, but uh, as a company, we have to be able to do things uh, in the here and now as well to generate revenue to keep us going long enough for all the tissue engineers to come up with all of these amazing organs that will someday uh, be developed until, until aging uh, makes them unnecessary. Uh, so one of the things that we've looked at is replacing tissues rather than organs. And uh, the primary example of that is the cornea. There are over one million cases of corneal blindness every year. Uh, it's only addressable with banking because you can't ship corneas from where you have them to where they're needed uh, without having them deteriorate in the process. So there's no competition out there because nobody else has a method that really works uh, in a practical way. Uh, so we're uh, looking at that fairly intensively. Of course, the cornea is the clear structure at the front of your eye. Uh, it's what you see through, and uh, it's entirely dependent for its functionality on a monolayer of cells at the back of the cornea called corneal endothelial cells. So you're going to hear me say a lot of things about corneal endothelial cells just to show you that we can preserve these things. Um, this is a graph that shows how many uh, of these cells there are per square millimeter. Uh, when we get the uh, corneas from the eye bank, graphed against how many there are after we've vitrified and rewarmed the cornea. And this line shows uh, what would happen if there was no change. And as you can see, there is no change. So unlike other methods, uh, we can preserve every single cell uh, on the cornea, and they're all viable. None of them are dead. This is a viability stain. And they're all stuck together correctly. Those are junctions between the cells, all staining correctly. So we got uh, encouraged, we transplanted some of these human corneas into rabbits, they stayed clear. So we took that to NIH, we got a grant, uh, and uh, we obtained human corneas from eye banks. We shipped them in the vitrified state to the island of St. Kitts in the Eastern Caribbean, and then we transplanted them into vervet monkeys so that we could follow their uh, fate over a four month observation time in vivo. And, um, uh, we also compared them to control corneas, and by the way, that's where St. Kitts is, in case anyone's curious, there's Florida, Cuba, there's St. Kitts. Um, the bottom line is that most of the corneas uh, that were in the control group looked like that. They were uh, opaque, white, 
That's, that part survived, but that part didn't. But most of our vitrified corneas were clear. They looked good in the electron microscope uh, when we took them out. And, and the loss rate was, ex, uh, was uh, compatible with human clinical norms. So it's a very viable uh, uh, project, uh, unlike the control corneas that lost many cells very rapidly. Uh, another area for us in the short run would be therapeutic cell replacement. We have vitrified whole pig and human cartilage, uh, isolated cells from them, found no difference after either cryoprotectin exposure or vitrification. We vitrified mouse egg cells, essentially no damage versus the other competing technology. And uh, we have data on human uh, egg cells coming along as well. I mentioned uh, the drug uh, discovery aspect of cryopreservation. This just shows that liver slices vitrified in our lab recover 100% compared to the control liver slices. Uh, this just shows that brain slices vitrified in our lab also recover completely compared to what they uh, would do for us prior to vitrifying them. And uh, this, what, this is what they look like. This is an entire section of brain uh, with viable brain cells, highly viable brain cells after vitrification, warming, and washing out of the cryoprotectin and, and warming back up to uh, body temperature. We can even preserve memory responses in these brain cells. This is a biological memory trace, you might say. The long-term potentiation is a function of this part of the brain. And after vitrification, we can induce that response absolutely as well as in controlled brain slices, something that uh, is relevant to Ralph and um, um, Rob later. Um, OK, so just to touch on this, uh, this is data from a CIRM grant that, uh, that we tried to get with Mike. Um, just showing that uh, 21CM solutions, when diluted enough to freeze, give much higher freeze-thaw uh, recoveries uh, than control freezing methods when we are freezing human embryonic kidney cells. So freezing solutions are even a possibility for us. And we have one other product line we're developing, which is conventional organ preservation. We have a solution that preserves dog kidneys for four days, just pack them in ice and uh, take them out four days later and uh, they're very little, uh, damage very little. It's highly statistically significant, and uh, that's a market that's significant enough for us. So in summary, we think that uh, organ replacement on a large scale could significantly increase life expectancy, particularly if organ banking can be achieved. Uh, the market for that sort of thing, if fully realized, would be extremely large. So if we got even a very small fraction of that, it would be good for us. We are the world leader in the area of crop preservation by vitrification in general, uh, and in organs in particular, and we're the only institution that's ever vitrified an intact organ and transplanted it and had, had it support life. And we are approaching marketability for uh, several different products. Our motto is expanding the boundaries of preservation science, and we'll continue to do that until it makes a difference for you. Thank you. Thank you. So questions? Thank you, Greg. Sure. I'm with a group uh, uh, in sports medicine. We're, we're doing, um, putting people in the chambers for about two or three minutes at minus 110 Celsius for sports uh, recovery. What is it? Okay. These are, these are rooms made by, uh, in Europe particularly, that go from minus, let's say, 30 to 60 to minus 110 Celsius for about two to three minutes. Okay. And about two or three minutes after you've been in there, patient, I mean, let's say, let's say athletes get faster recovery. Maybe you can comment on that. There's also this issue of cold shock proteins maybe are involved. I, I, I can't No, actually. there's cold shock. I mean, there are cold shock proteins because these there people are. are being down to 110 minus for about two or three minutes, and they come out much faster recovered than ordinary methods. Um, you're talking about whole people going into these? Total things? people yeah. going into a room. You can go to Zimmer.com. <laughs> Zimmer, there's, there's tons of companies, not tons, but like maybe five or six companies in the world making these rooms. These are very popular in spas in Europe now. Yeah, For I can't. Other reasons, there's anti aging potential here. I, I can't exactly comment on the mechanism, um, but it's an interesting thing to, to look into. Obviously, that would induce a very profound physiological response cortisol release, blood vessel constriction, all kinds of stuff, tachycardia, epinephrine release, whatever. And it may be that those secondary hormonal responses and neural responses somehow stimulate the system. It's sort of like a hormetic effect, perhaps. That that's be, would be my guess. Hormesis. 
Hormesis. Yes. I think you're right. I think there's some mention of hormesis, hormesis yes. effect. Thank you. Okay. I guess it was clear. So I guess if there are no other questions, I'll take uh, take my leave. Thank you.